Good afternoon and welcome to the three minute thesis at the University of Edinburgh, uh, the culmination of a fantastic uh, sort of experience for our finalists and also a chance for us to really showcase this afternoon some of the wonderful interesting research that we do here. My name is Sarah Shinton and I work within the Institute of Academic Development uh, with colleagues all over the university to try and create a really great environment for our research students and to ensure that we prepare them for the challenges of a PhD and what comes beyond. There's a few official welcomes. The first is to the audience in the room, the staff and students from across the university who are here to support our finalists. You are most welcome and we really appreciate that and I'm sure on behalf of all the finalists, we're really pleased that you've come here uh, to, to wish them well and to, to help them make the most of this opportunity. I'd also like to welcome everyone who's watching us online. This was a sellout, um, as it is every year, and we're aware that there are many of you who would like to have been here. We shall try to make it as entertaining as possible for those of you watching at home and around the university. In a moment, I'll introduce the judges, but I shall just preempt that by thanking them for their time. Uh, they have the most difficult job in the room, um, as you will see, but so do you, and I shall elaborate on that later. And by last and by no means least, the finalists themselves. Thank you for engaging in this process and for doing it so well. You're all going to have a fantastic afternoon here. Before I introduce the finalists to you, I just want to give you a little bit of context and background to the competition itself um, and to explain where it's come from. So this is an international experience. We are joining an international club. Um, Three Minute Thesis came out of the University of Queensland back in 2008 and was one of the earliest research development opportunities to give a, a broad platform to researchers. It was enthusiastically embraced in Australia and very quickly became national, so by 2010 across Australia and New Zealand, and a multinational final developed quickly. It grew and grew, came to the UK 2011, 2012, and it's growing and it's now a global phenomenon. So the videos that we produce of this afternoon's finalists have the potential to be viewed by thousands and thousands of people. We've always been keen to take part in this and we, we engage very quickly, not just because um, it's, it's a global uh, phenomenon, but because this is a, a great opportunity for our researchers to really shine, to develop skills that are going to take them through their PhDs and far, far beyond. We ran our first event in 2013 and it was really popular and many of you will have been here year after year to see the, the finalists compete. The way that we work it is at college and school level, so there is a much broader pool of three-minute thesis presenters within the university, and we've whittled it down and whittled it down to the, our fantastic finalists today. Today is a beginning, not an end. There is a national final, and one of our finalists will go forward to that um, and have the opportunity to present their research again on that national stage. Six of them, six finalists nationally, will go to the final competition um, in September, which is in God's own city of Birmingham. Um, so, you know, it, you thought the, the bonuses just never stop with this competition. There is also a global competition. Um, so the University, University Has 21, a network which we belong to at Edinburgh, um, picked up on this and realised that the enthusiasm, the creativity um, of 3MT was something that they fitted with their, their, their vision. And their vision is about global citizenship and innovation. So our finalists will compete, sadly, in a virtual online final, but to be honest, Birmingham is probably the pinnacle, um, and that will take place in October. There's a lot to understand about 3MT. I'm just going to give you a very quick overview. It's simple rules, but they mask a very complex process for our finalists. They have three minutes, and they have one slide. Now, you've all stopped looking at me, and you're all reading this slide. This slide that's packed with information, and this is one of the big challenges of 3MT. You have one slide that has to be relevant and engaging throughout a three-minute talk. So what you see in front of you appears deceptively simple. It really isn't. They also have to break down a thesis, a PhD thesis, into three minutes. Um, they have to make it engaging and entertaining and memorable for a non-specialist audience. So I suspect that you are going to be fooled into thinking that this is a straightforward challenge. I'd encourage you all to try this at home, because what we see here is, is, is a very difficult task. All of these ideas have to be crystallised into a meaningful and impactful message that comes at the end, and then your job will be to decide which of those was most meaningful and most impactful. So... Your, three, your thesis in three minutes. These are very simple criteria, but they're also very strict. 
Once the three minutes are up, our finalists will stop talking, whatever stage they're at. So again, speaking without notes, they have to really understand how that time is flowing as they're speaking. Automatic disqualification, I'm afraid. They all know this. The judges are sitting over here and across the room. You are all going to judge this competition. These are the things you need to bear in mind. One, PA, one PowerPoint slide, we've dealt with that for you. But what I need you to do in this room is to think about what has impressed you about the communication, the comprehension, and the engagement here. In front of everyone in the room is a judge's form and some criteria, and we'll come back to these a little later. I'll pick up on these and remind you of them a little later. Um, but I'm just going to go through very briefly some of the highlights of this. Um, it's aimed at an intelligent lay audience. We'd like to think that we can do that at Edinburgh. I hope we have an intelligent lay audience in the room. One slide. No additional media. There is no soundtrack. There is no animation. There's nothing exciting other than the person who's standing in front of you. There are no props. There are no glove puppets. There are, there's no juggling allowed. It is purely the, the, the research of themselves. And sadly, there are no poems or raps allowed, which I, personally I think we could... Uh, flex on that. If anybody wishes to wrap, we'll look at that for next year. As you go through your talk, all of you need to make sure that the audience in front of you is well informed about the research that you're doing. They understand how it's happening, they understand what's being discovered, and they understand the so what. What are you contributing to us? You have a detailed form in front of you, we'll come back to this later, but for those of you watching at home, I invite you too to make your decision about who your favourites are, because something very important is at stake. The first place is a contribution to international conference expenses. Um, research is a global endeavour, and so the opportunity for these researchers to put their ideas forward and network and engage with people um, will really add value to the research that they're doing. As we've said, you go forward to the UK competition and to the University of Das 21 final. The runner-up gets a £400 voucher for them to spend on self-improvement, and we'll find out what that means later. Um, but there is also a people's choice. So you will judge the people's choice. And the people's choice is a, you know, a really important thing for you to engage in this afternoon. Um, you see what's at stake here, and you see the, the, the platform that this competition represents. And I hope that you will all take this seriously. The winner of the people's choice receives an iPad mini. So as the live audience in the room, you've got a really important role. You vote for your favourite of the presentations. When you arrived, you should have received a voting sheet. If any of you don't have one of those, we'll make sure we get those to you at the break. And as you watch, I just want you to think about who has had the greatest impact on you, which is the most, the most effectively communicated, which is the most engaging talk. When we break, after all the finalists have finished, you will hand your forms in um, on the way out. The judges. The judges, as I say, have a difficult decision this afternoon. The other two prizes, the international conference voucher and the, and the £400 voucher, will be decided by them. So I just want to introduce them to you briefly. I'll start off with Fiona Filippi, my colleague in IAD. Fiona's the head of doctoral education. She's the deputy head of research and development. And she has oversight of our really comprehensive training and development program for research students. She has a background in research, working in political science and law, and now she brings that experience across the university. She's running a number of projects at the moment that are trying to enhance the support and the provision that we offer here. Sean Bain, welcome, is a professor of digital education, and she's our assistant principal for digital education. And I think as we sit here in the informatics forum, you know, it's an important reminder of how important this is to Edinburgh. She directs the Centre for Research into Digital Education within Murray House, and she's currently focusing on critical approaches to teaching automation, open and distance education, and applying theory from humanities and social sciences to digital education. We also welcome from a little further afield, Gary Kerr. So Gary is a scientist turned social scientist. Everybody loves those, Gary. Um, his research now is into science festivals. So you see, he, he will particularly be aware of the mechanism for communicating this afternoon. So he is a, a researcher at the University of Salford in Manchester, but also a freelance trainer. He works with clients across universities to try and improve communication skills. So he will be on the lookout for some really effective behaviours. 
He's also a former winner of 3MT. So he feels what you're feeling at the moment, and I'm sure there's huge waves of empathy coming across the auditorium towards you. Further waves of empathy from Maddie Long, who is last year's winner. So I'm delighted Maddie's come back to join us, and we're going to talk to her in a moment. She's a third-year PhD student in philosophy, psychology, and language sciences here at Edinburgh, and explores the relationship between language and cognition across the lifespan. As well as winning the University of Edinburgh final, she was also the People's Choice winner at UK level. Welcome our judges, thank you. So, we're going to take a, br a brief interlude before the hard work begins. Maddie, would you like to come and join me at the front of the room? Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So, I'm going to start with just a little bit of preamble about the competition itself. And why on earth did you apply for this? As you stand here under the spotlight, reliving it all, why did you do it? Um, well, I'd heard about the competition in passing, but I didn't really know what it entailed. So I went to the university final before I actually entered the competition. And I was just amazed at the range of topics and how every one of the speakers made each topic relatable and interesting and fascinating to me and that I could understand all of it. And I wanted to see um, if I was able to do the same thing because I'm also really passionate about the work that I do and I wanted to see if I could present it to anyone at any time. Which you clearly did. So along the way, you must have picked up a few skills and, and ideas and learning. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, public speaking skills are the first thing you learn. Um, as I'm up here, I'm still very nervous, but you learn to manage your nerves and to um, try to engage a crowd and find things about your topic that anyone can relate to and make it accessible to anyone at any time. Fantastic. So, as we said, the final today is the beginning, not the end. What happened to you after you walked out of this room last year? Um, I think I approached, um, the way I approached giving talks at conferences and public engagement and even teaching um, was a lot different. I think I looked for ways to explain things using analogies and using um, experiences that we can all relate to to convey messages and to really engage the public and it's that back and forth that's really rewarding. And can you tell us about some of the places it took you? So some of the events and some of the, the, the rooms that you've been in since? Yeah, um, so after this, after I was fortunate enough to win this, um, I went to Manchester for the, the UK final um, and having won the UK People's Choice Award, I was um, presented with the opportunity to give a talk at the Royal Institution in London, which was such an honor. Um, it was a great opportunity. And anything within the university? What sort, of, what sort of places have opened up to you within? So presentations at any of our big committees and things like that? Right, right. I got to present my talk at the Senate committee. Um, and, and all of these opportunities to present your talk in front of different audiences gives you the, the chance to network with different researchers. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, all of these are being filmed and so you can send this to people around the world. You might find um, new research opportunities, collaborations. Um, you might find after you give a talk today that someone in the audience will come up to you and, and sort of come up with something you hadn't thought of before which may translate into future research. Um, it's a really unique opportunity. Fantastic. And at the risk of making them more nervous, can we finish with any words of advice for our finalists today? Sure. I think um, there's no wrong way to present your research. I think just try to show your enthusiasm for the tax. Try to be as relaxed as possible. I know that's extremely hard. I know it's easy for me to say now at this position. But um, yeah, just I think you know, go out there. The audience is here to support you. They want you to do well, so just go and give it your best shot. Wonderful. So. Maddie, thank you very much. So much. Okay, so I'm just going to take you through the, the timeline for this afternoon, just so that you've got a sense of how we're, we're going to run through. We're about to start the presentations, so 
nice calming breaths, everybody. Um, and those will run through to approximately 10 past three. We'll then take a break, and that is when the judges will deliberate and when you as the audience will make your people's choice decision. We'll then reconvene in here very promptly at 3.40 to announce the winners um, and to celebrate that moment with them before we finish at four o'clock. I'm going to give you the running order and where everybody's come from. And as this shows, it's, right, it's a whole university endeavour today. Um, I'm really pleased that all the colleges have represented so strongly. Um, and I just in, invite you to, um, to enjoy this afternoon and to have your eyes opened as well about the diversity of research that we do here. All that remains for me to do is to wish you all good luck and to remind you that this in itself is an amazing, um, it's something really to celebrate, that you're here today with us. We're, we're so proud of you already, so enjoy it if you can. Sorry, there's somebody else telling you to enjoy it. This is obviously purgatory, but we'll get it over with. So without further ado, I'm going to begin, and I'm going to invite our first finalist, Jennifer Dudu, up to the front. Look around you. There are roughly 150 people in the room today. Three of you are likely to suffer from gout at some point in your life. Gout is a painful and debilitating disease. One sufferer, the artist James Gilry, pictured his illness as the attack of a demon-like creature which claws and bites into his foot. The pain that he illustrates is caused by uric acid crystals which form in his tendons and joints due to a high concentration of uric acid in his blood. We all have uric acid in our blood. It enters our bodies through the food that we consume. Whether or not we develop gout depends on genetic factors as well as our diet. Gout sufferers can manage their condition through a healthy diet and medication. But to anticipate and prevent a painful attack, it is vital that they can monitor their uric acid levels regularly, ideally by testing themselves in the comfort of their home. There are no such tests available at the moment, as uric acid levels are being measured in blood or urine by trained medical personnel. In my research, I'm developing a biosensor that uses saliva to detect blood uric acid concentrations. Patients could easily do this at home by extracting some of their saliva on a test strip and inserting it into the sensor. To detect uric acid, we make use of the enzyme uricase. Uricase breaks down uric acid into electrical charge carriers, which we can detect as an electrical current by sticking two electrodes into the saliva. The current that we measure increases proportionally with the concentration of uric acid in the saliva, but for high concentrations, this increase is flattening off. This is due to our charge carriers slowing down. If we want our biosensor to work, we need to speed up those charge carriers. How can we do this? With a clever electrode design. Our electrodes consist of nanoelectrode arrays. Nanoelectrodes are tiny electrodes, one millionth of a millimeter wide, and we place nearly 2,000 of them on a five by five millimeter square. Nanoelectrodes are extremely sensitive. They can detect tiny currents, like those produced when measuring uric acid in saliva. And charge carriers can travel very fast to and from them, allowing us to measure the full range of physiological uric acid concentrations. We believe that with our sensor, gout sufferers can soon manage their condition with more ease. Thank you. Jennifer, thank you so much for getting this kicked off. I'm going to say a few words about Jennifer. I didn't want to say this before because we wanted to get you up. Being first is, is challenging. So Jennifer is from our School of Engineering, if you didn't pick that up. She's got a background in physics, which she studied at St Andrews. Um, so the, as, you, as you gather, the nanotech biosensor that she is researching uh, monitors uric acid levels in saliva, which improves detection and prevention of gout attacks. However, she is also, uh, like many of our finalists, has many other strings to bows. She can ride a unicycle, which again really makes me regret the fact that we don't have props in this final, um, and enjoys photography. Jennifer, thank you for getting us started. So while our judges are making their deliberations, we're going to put in a little, uh, little insert between each finalist 
And I just want to talk to you a little bit about the process that these have all gone through to get here. So we have local level heats within Edinburgh. Every school who takes part runs a school heat. This usually takes place in around March and then leads towards our college finals, which happen in April. The three finalists of each college heat come here to the university final. My suspicion is, is this process means that you've practiced these talks now many dozens, if not, it probably feels like hundreds of times. And Jennifer, it certainly showed in yours. Very polished, so congratulations for starting off so well. We'd really like you to get involved in this next year. If you are sitting here as a PhD student or if you sit here with, with power and influence over PhD students, please encourage them to get involved. We'll be running an information session in November and our finalists are all really strongly supported. Um, there's a lot of training available. Delighted to see Ian who helps us train our finalists here, willing them all to success. Um, so we have lots of information about 3MT on our website. So if you are tempted, please do get involved next year. So. We're going to move on to our next finalist, who is Ewan Deutsch from the School of Chemistry. Do come up, Ewan. So Ewan's from Northern Degree in East Lothian, just on the coast east of Edinburgh, and his research looks at new reagents for the recovery of critical metals, like gold and lanthanides, from waste electronics. Um, Ewan is a homegrown. He studied his chemistry here at Edinburgh, and again, in addition to chemistry, he enjoys puns, pianos, puzzles, and alliteration, apparently. When you are ready, Ewan, thank you. Gold is an important metal. We adore it in jewellery. We value it as currency. We rely on it in modern electronics. And you can eat it. It even has an E number. But where does gold come from? Gold is found naturally in rocks and ores, but only in a few places around the world in really low concentrations alongside other metals. This is a problem. We use incredible amounts of energy and resources, including toxic chemicals like cyanide mining and processing tons of rock to get just a few grams of gold out. This all has a severe and detrimental impact on the environment and our health. We need a better solution. From one tonne of rock, you can get up to a gram of gold. But you can get 300 grams of gold from one tonne of mobile phones. It's therefore much more efficient and environmentally friendlier to recycle gold from waste, electrical and electronic equipment called we, instead of mining it. Around 40 million tonnes of wee is sent to landfill every year. This is an urban gold mine. But wee has many metals in it, and gold's not the most abundant one in there. How do I get gold out of your phone? This is where my research comes in. I investigate chemical methods for the recovery of metals without having to use toxic reagents. I use a process called solvent extraction, which has two liquids. We can dissolve all of the metals out of your phone and into an acidic water solution. This gives us a mixture of metals, including gold, which is the most valuable to recycle. The other liquid is an oil which sits on top of the water and doesn't mix into it, much like oil sits on balsamic vinegar. I design molecules called extractants that transport the metal of choice out of the water and into the oil. If we can do this selectively, then we can separate gold from the mixture. This is a sort of molecular level gold panning. We're sifting through all the metals in the mixture and only collecting the one that we want. So how do we get selective gold separation? Every metal in the water has a certain size, likes to form certain shapes in solution, has a certain charge, basically has a preferred chemistry. For example, gold likes to form flat squares. Platinum likes to form octahedra. I design molecules that can discriminate between the metals based on these features, bind to gold and only gold, and transport it into the oil. This selectivity is a bit like the child's toy where you can't get the round peg in the square hole. My molecules are particularly efficient. Not only do they recognize gold squares, they transport multiple at once as molecular golden nuggets. This gives us more metal out for less chemical used. We can then separate off the gold containing oil and treat it to give us back the gold we treasure in an overall more efficient and less damaging process. At the start, I asked, where does gold come from? I'll repose the question, where should gold come from? The answer is we, because we are golden. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ewan. You certainly didn't disappoint on the pond front there, so well done for sustaining that throughout. So I just want to take a moment to, to acknowledge the fact that we are live streaming at the moment, and we'd also encourage you to live tweet. 
So the hashtag, for those of you who tweet, um, not finalists, I see some of them digging around in their pockets, you can you need to concentrate. Uh, the hashtag for those of you who tweet is UOE3MT17. So if any of you are uh, out there in the Twitterverse, please do um, go and tell the world what we're doing. World Wide Web and the social media play a big part in this competition, uh, and it's really one of the glues that holds it together as a global experience. Um, we are in the fifth year here at Edinburgh. Um, I don't, again, I'm not sure whether I need to give you this information. Previous finals have had over 14,000 views. So this really is uh, you know, a, a window into the world here today. Um, the average individual videos get approximately 1,000 views. So this is a really marvellous platform as a young researcher to, to show your research and yourself to the world. There is a three-minute thesis Twitter page as well, Twitter feed, so that if any of you are interested in what you've heard today and want to learn more bite-sized nuggets, golden nuggets of, uh, of research, you will find those around the world um, and regularly using the three-minute thesis tweet. The feedback from University of Task 21 who are in the global competition is that universities who have the best social media sort of platforms and promotion are the ones that often are most successful in the University of Task 21's People's Choice vote. So uh, I'll just leave that with you, Edinburgh, uh, that let's get tweeting and see what we can do. The University of Task 21 competition is in October and believe me, IAD, will be, we will be reminding you regularly and often um, as we approach that. Because I have great confidence again that we're going to have a finalist at the, uh, at the global competition. So, the judges have deliberated, we're ready to move on. So could I invite Laura Glendinning to take the stage here? Laura, welcome. Laura is from the Roslyn Institute. Uh, and she's going to bring us into the bizarre world of sheep lung bacteria. Now in her fourth year, she studies bacterial communities which live in healthy sheep lungs. Originally from Wrighton, a small town near Newcastle, she studied medical microbiology as an undergraduate at Leeds. She has always loved bacteria. Um, and thanks to an amazing biology teacher, Mr Moody, um, she, she has built this career. She's also a massive board game geek. <laughs> Laura, thank you. When you're ready. Sheep are strange. It's often tempting to think that sheep and people have a lot in common. Indeed, I'm sure you can think of some people where that is probably quite fair. When I started my PhD, I also assumed that sheep and people had a lot in common. Previously, sheep had been used extensively in respiratory disease research as their respiratory and immune systems are very similar to our own. I wanted to see whether the types of bacteria in sheep lungs were also similar to those found in humans. If this was the case, then we might be able to use the sheep as a model in respiratory diseases which involve these bacterial communities. What I found is that the sheep lung is a very different a very complicated and a very strange place. For example, in healthy humans, you will generally find the same types of bacteria all over the lungs, not so in sheep. If you take a sheep lung sample and then another one from two centimeters away, you will find completely different bacterial communities. Also, when you look in a healthy human lung, you'll generally find bacteria which have been pretty well studied. Again, not so in the sheep. I often find bacteria which have previously barely been studied at all, including one very common bacteria in my sheep that was originally isolated from Korean fermented seafood. As I've been traveling through my PhD, and finding these weird and wonderful bacteria, it's made me wonder what other bacteria might be lurking in the respiratory systems of other animals. Maybe something that can produce the next antibiotic, or that could be used in bioenergy production. Because the majority of research focuses on microbes which inhabit humans, we might be missing out on a vast array of potentially useful weirdness. So don't let anyone tell you that sheep are boring. Sheep are interesting. The bacteria they contain could be very useful. And they are very, very strange. Thank you.
Laura, thank you very much. Everything is interesting to PhD students, everything. So, we're coming on now to our next little intervention. As you can see, I'm calling these the three MT, two MTs. So, in between each of the talks, we're going to have a little two-minute slot. So, I've decided to call these the two-minute training. So, prepare to be trained, audience. The next idea is, as you've seen, people are talking about their PhDs this afternoon in probably quite a different way to the way that they talk to their supervisors about it and the colleagues that they have around them. But this flexibility of communication is a critical skill that we all need as researchers. Effective communication centres on the recipient. And as a PhD student, there are lots of different sorts of people that you should be engaging who won't have an expertise but will have an interest. What we're doing this afternoon is giving a particular example of a way of adapting the message of the PhD to different audiences. But I'd just like you to ponder for a moment about the different sorts of people that you could be talking to about your research. Whatever your decision is about what comes next in your career as a PhD student, not forgetting that over half PhDs immediately leave university and go off into all sorts of interesting things, um, you will need to engage with lots of different people. If you are going to change direction after this and go into something which doesn't relate to research, you'll need to be talking about the skills gained. If you're going to go off into a sector that applies research in a different way, you'll have to think about different stories. But this short slot is just to get you to consider, when you're communicating about your research, are you considering the recipient? What we've seen so far is that our presenters are beautifully considering the recipients here in the room and really effectively providing an intelligent lay audience with an insight into the wonders of their research. Um, there's another reason that you should be engaging people, but I'm going to come on to that when we've gone through our next finalist. So, Toby, could I invite you to take the floor? So, Toby is in our MRC Institute of Genetics and Molecular Medicine. He's a second year PhD student who's interested in the mechanisms that initiate cancer and wants to better understand these processes to improve screening of patients or design better th novel therapeutics. Tony's originally, Toby is originally from Wrexham in North Wales, and his first degree in biological sciences was from the University of Oxford. He has a master's in post-genomic biology from the University of York. He's a huge fan of nature documentaries, but has one regret in life, which is that he missed the opportunity to get David Attenborough to sign his book. We'll see where this takes you, Toby. Anything is possible when you're ready. Why do people get cancer? Cancer is caused by an accumulation of mistakes or mutations in your DNA, which is like the instruction manual for your body. Now, these mutations can be caused by smoking, sunburn, poor diet. However, unfortunately, some people are born with certain mutations already in their DNA, which make them more likely to get cancer during their lifetime. And this is called having cancer predisposition. Now, people have already studied predisposition to colon cancer by taking thousands of people who have the disease and comparing their DNA with thousands of people who don't. Using statistics, they have found the mistakes which most commonly occur within the DNA of those people with the disease, and these are called predisposing mutations. So we know those mutations exist, but those types of studies don't do anything to tell us how they predispose to cancer. My PhD aims to find this out, because understanding the mechanism of predisposition will allow us to do more effective screening of people at high risk of colon cancer and may allow us to design better therapies in the future. Now, the main hypothesis I am testing is that these mistakes are causing errors in alternative splicing. Now, to explain alternative splicing, let me take you back to the year 2000, when scientists first sequenced the whole human genome and so were able to read every instruction written in every gene in our DNA. Now, the scientists had originally estimated you would need a minimum of 100,000 different instructions in order to build a whole human. However, they only actually found 20,000 different genes. How can this be? Scientists don't always get it right, I can tell you that. Now, the answer came from alternative splicing, which is the way that instructions get sent from the DNA into the cell to be interpreted. Now, DNA lives in the nucleus of the cell, and each gene sends out an instruction made of RNA, which is similar to DNA, but is simpler and less stable. Now, it turns out that each gene is not a fixed instruction, as the scientists had assumed, but is actually made up of interchangeable blocks, which can be thought of like words in a sentence. Now, these words can be arranged in different ways when forming the RNA, meaning that each gene is actually adaptable and is able to send out more than one different instruction. 
Now, the way this links back to cancer predisposition is if people have a mutation in their DNA, that could cause a mistake in what word gets sent out in what order, and cells could get the wrong instruction. For example, instead of saying, don't grow now, a cell could be told, grow fast now. And over time, this could cause a tumor to develop. So in my PhD, I'm analyzing the DNA and the RNA from patients with colon cancer. And so far, I've been able to find more than 600 different DNA mutations, which cause changes in the ways these words are sent out in the RNA. These mutations are repeatedly found within the list of known predisposing mutations, meaning I can say that changes in alternative splicing are likely to be one of the reasons why some people are more likely to get colon cancer than others. Thank you. Toby, thank you very much. So, a bit of audience participation now. Can anyone tell me what these are? Mm, chocolates is close, but anybody else? Yeah, you, you all need to go shopping a little bit more often. These are heroes, right? Well, I can do puns too. So what I want to talk to you about is the, I said to you I was going to come back to you about the fact that we need to all be engaging people beyond our supervisors and our immediate PhD. Because you, those of you in the room who are PhD researchers, you're real heroes. You're people who are devoting your lives to really understanding and progressing ideas. And researchers should be seen as heroes in society, but it's all of our jobs to make that happen. So what I want to do in this little two-minute slot is, is to sort of really push on you the importance of going out into society and telling people how wonderful and how special and how important and how relevant research is to all of them. We've really suffered in recent years. More than I imagine more of us would have thought possible four or five years ago, we have really suffered from a perception that expertise is a bad thing. Expertise is a wonderful thing, but we need to make it accessible and open to others. Everybody here has a responsibility to shift this. So can I encourage you all to think about what those opportunities are for you? There's a myriad of festivals which open up to the public, the science festivals that Gary looks into, the, the, the work that we do here at the university. But please, can you all think about going out and engaging people and letting them see not just what we do here at this university, but what everybody engaged in research does. It might be inspiring children to take forward the subjects that you love, going out there and getting them. So, uh, I, you know, there was a, a group from physics two days ago out in a local primary school, getting them to think about sunscreen, of all things, the physics of sunscreen. It might be that your role is to go and engage policymakers so that they make decisions based on evidence and reality rather than the perceptions of some sections of our media. It might be that you want to talk to companies and to embed in them the ideas of what you're doing and help them take it forward. There are lots and lots of opportunities around the university. Can I just invite you all to have a look around? There's probably an outreach officer sitting very close to you in your school. Go and have a chat with them and uh, show everybody we can all be heroes. Thank you, and we will move on. William, could I invite you to the front? So our next finalist, William, is from our School of Social and Political Sciences. He's a fourth-year PhD student looking into the use of reconceptualized theory of social evolution to understand social change. So he examines and critiques other theories um, from this perspective and applies this to a comparative case study. William was born in Ireland to British parents and raised in Luxembourg. He studied film, radio, and television when he was an undergraduate at Canterbury Christ Church University. And again, a wholly formed person, he enjoys drawing and going out for walks in his spare time. William, thank you. When you're ready. Why do societies change? How do they change? In my research, I examine these key questions by using social evolutionary theory to understand social change. So what is social evolution? Social evolution operates on the same three principles as Darwinian evolution. There's the principle of variety, that variations are generated through a mutation and recombination process, the principle of inheritance, that these varieties can be carried through time, and the principle of selection, that environmental differences will mean that certain varieties are going to be more successful or adaptive than others. This, though, is not a story of progress, but a story of contingency. Gills, for example, are wonderful adaptations to an ocean environment, but they'd be sort of useless to you in a desert. The same is true with societies. 
In a competition for resources, certain institutions are going to be better adapted to local environmental conditions than others, leading to branching pathways. How do these concepts apply to social change? In my research, I compared the rise of nationalism in Britain and Japan. They share some surface similarities. They're both islands, as you can see. But they have environmental differences that led to their different pathways of development. Britain had Protestantism, which gave the different kingdoms within it a shared ideological ground. And also, being only 30 kilometers away from Europe, it couldn't avoid conflicts on the mainland. War helped to produce a sense of an in-group and an out-group, an us and a them, and so generate a sense of being one nation. Japan, by contrast, was 200 kilometers away from the mainland, so it could isolate itself. Its division between the military government and the emperor, plus the greater strength in the regions, meant that there was no need or possibility for a variety of nationalism to be created, and it would not have had an adaptive use. It was only with the intrusion of the West that the new variety was created and spread quickly to enable Japan to catch up with the West. This happens through the intended and unintended consequences of the choices that people make. The samurai, for example, didn't mean to disenfranchise themselves when they launched their revolution that overthrew the military government, but that's what ended up happening. Within a few years of the Meiji government, the samurai class was gone, as the new nation-state structure had no need for a specialized warrior class. Such an overt separation would have undermined the ideological belief that the people were all equal and deserving on meritocratic criteria. What is the importance of using social evolutionary theory to understand social change? It's not because it can predict where our societies are going, but because by understanding the contingent factors that produced our societies, as well as knowing how and why good and bad ideas and structures spread, we can learn how to choose to make our societies better. Thank you. Thank you, William. Right, another slight pause, and I'm going to uh, give you all a high five. The high five in this uh, little moment is about the IAD. You are a captive audience, a captive global audience, so we're going to take a moment to celebrate how wonderful the Institute for Academic Development is. I've only been in IAD since January, um, and I've, I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to come here and make a real difference to researchers, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about five things that we can do. The first thing is, we hope we work hard to try and make your PhD a little bit easier to do. We run a lot of training courses on aspects like managing the PhD, um, preparing for the viva, writing academically, and these are things that perhaps you might spring to mind, but please do engage with those programs and courses. We work hard to try and get them to be as relevant to you as always, as, as possible, and we are listening constantly to what you need. Another thing that we do as well is that we try to help you improve your, your personal impact. We also run a number of courses which are about things like time management, uh, about speaking in public, about networking, to help you as an individual develop as a professional and when you're ready to go out into different places that you're well equipped to do that. I hope that through that we also contribute as number three to, to building your confidence. Doing a PhD is a challenge. Um, I think it is probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life for the skills and the, and the preparation that I had at the time, but that's given me huge confidence then. One of the things we want to do is give you confidence while you're doing it. So we are working on a number of initiatives at the moment, but one in particular on resilience to try and help our researchers feel equipped and ready to cope with the challenges and to relish them and, and look after themselves. So I hope that we can build your confidence. Another thing that we do Hard, we try hard to do is to represent your interests. This is a very big organisation with lots of different things going on in it. But one of the things we do at ID, IED is make sure that research students and research staff are always considered when decisions are being made. So again, let us know what your concerns are and we will feed those through. Um, and the final thing, I've saved the best till last, uh, we'll give you money. So if there's something you'd like to do, obviously not to say nice things about us, although I, I'm up for a negotiation on that, um, but we have a number of funds that enable you to take forward the things you want to do. If you feel that there's something you could do to develop as researchers in a community, if you want to build new networks, we have funds to help you do that. So I hope that that two minute, you know, while you're pinned in and the doors are locked, helps you understand and perhaps get a little bit more from us. Okay, we're ready to continue. Izzy. So Izzy joined us again from the, one of our MRC institutes, Genetics and Molecular Medicine. And her presentation is in front of you. Um, as a chemist, I'm not even going to try and say these words. Izzy, we'll leave that to you. Um, she is going to, to talk to us about her research. 
She's originally from the Wirral in Merseyside, where she studied genetics with a year in industry at the University of Liverpool. Her top career choice, this is a top career choice, um, was to work in pizza delivery with her own moped. I think you've settled a bit too much, actually, Izzy. I think that aspiration <laughs> needs to stay with you. But having gone through Plan B, she's now doing her PhD in genetics. Izzy, when you're ready. How many of you have had a baking disaster where your cake just refused to rise? When I was first born, my parents both gave me cake recipes. They were both relatively similar, but they did have their own quirks. For instance, my dad's questionable choice of icing. Regardless, I decided it would be nice to pass on my own recipe to my kids. But before I did so, I got a bit creative in the kitchen, mixing up instructions and ingredients between my two recipes, meaning that in actual fact, each of my kids inherited a unique reassortment of my parents' original recipes. Now actually, a very similar process happens in the cells that go on to produce your eggs and sperm. It's known as meiotic recombination, and essentially, it acts like a physical cut and paste tool, exchanging chunks of information between the genetic recipes which you inherited from your parents, meaning that the instructions that you pass on to your kids are not quite the same as those which you inherited from your parents. But with all this cutting and pasting, how do we safeguard the integrity of our genetic recipes? If recombination happens at the wrong time, the wrong place, the wrong frequency, then you'll probably end up with a genetic recipe where your cake just won't rise. What I'm really interested in looking at is how the DNA itself regulates recombination. If we were to zoom in on this DNA, we would actually find that it's very much like a piece of string that loops in and out on itself, so much so that it packages up into structures known as chromosomes. But it's the looping that's important. For instance, one gene might have shorter loops, and as a consequence, is more likely to undergo recombination than a gene with longer loops. Therefore, by mapping this loop structure all the way along chromosomes, we can begin to understand more about where recombination is allowed to occur, what genetic information is being exchanged, and ultimately, how our genetic recipes are evolving over time. Now, I know that some people believe that evolution is irrelevant to the modern human species, but consider climate change, antibiotic resistance, or the aging population. Each of those issues will be overcome by change, and our bodies are helping us do that. With processes including recombination, we increase the likelihood of creating new beneficial genetic recipes, which could subdue the effects of aging, improve our tolerance to air pollution, or defeat those lethal bacterial infections. Meaning that by studying recombination, we can understand more about human evolution and survival, evolving from a relatively bland Victoria sponge to a much more magnificent Black Forest Gatto. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Right, let's come back to the idea of judging. So, you the judges. In front of all of you, I hope you've picked up a set of judging criteria. Now, what I want to do is just quickly take you through this. You're going to help make the decision about who gets our People's Choice Award today. And I just want to take a moment to remind you of what a responsibility this is. Um, everybody who has come forward to the final today you know, has done through on the back of it a lot of hard work and a lot of preparation. 3MT isn't a popularity contest. And so what I want to do in these couple of minutes is just to ensure that the finalists get what they deserve, which is to be judged fairly. So there are three criteria that we'd ask you to consider today. Communication, and you'll find more guidance on your sheet in front of you. But really just about making sure that the topic that they've, they're talking about, their thesis, has been communicated to you. And that you felt engaged as an audience. That there's been that eye contact, that sense of the fact that they're talking to you that they've avoided the use of any jargon that's meaningless to you. And this is a particular challenge. As PhDs, you spend most of your time talking to people who share a huge amount of common language with you. Have they remembered that many of you here today won't share that? And again, did you get the sense there was a pace as they were going through? A beginning, a middle, and an end. I'd like to think about comprehension. Do you now understand what they do, and could you explain it to somebody else? Have you got a sense about why what they're doing is important, what the significance of it is? 
And again, did you follow the story as it unfolded? And finally, the engagement. Are you all now frantically Googling in the corners of your, of your eye what this research is about and do you want to know more about it? Do you feel that you've been spoken to as somebody with a level of intelligence? You've not been dumbed down or spoken down to. You've been spoken to as somebody with intelligence on a topic that you're not familiar with. And again, do we see that enthusiasm? And I think we did. Like I said after one of the talks, you know, a PhD student, there's a PhD student for everything. Everything is interesting if you're a PhD student. Did they capture and maintain your attention? So could I ask you all to perhaps step away from your biases, your disciplinary biases, and think about who has engaged and communicated and conveyed the story of their thesis most effectively, and to think about whether you'd like to know more about them, and again, whether you could go and explain the things they've done to somebody else. Thank you, and we will move on. Tim, could I invite you up? So next up is Tim Squirrel from our School of Social and Political Sciences. Tim is a first-year PhD. He joins us from Southampton, um, originally from Southampton, and then Cyprus. So a graduate of Cambridge University, where he studied natural sciences, then the history and philosophy of science. His research attempts to understand why individuals start to believe certain nutritional precepts and how users on Reddit, which you kids will know, um, is a large forum-style website, um, negotiate authority and authorities in the field. I'm glad to hear that Tim spends a lot of time arguing with strangers in seminar rooms around the country because he's also involved in the Edinburgh University Debate User Union and teaches other students to do the same. This year he won the Use of Teaching Award for the best student who tutors for his first year of teaching. Tim, over to you. Bread. Is it the key to a healthy heart and a long life or will it drive you into an early grave? Such a simple question causes profound disagreement the evidence could push you one way or the other. And so what we decide to believe is more about who we decide to believe, who are our experts. I look at how people in online communities dedicated to the Paleolithic diet decide who and therefore what to believe. This is a lifestyle based around the idea that humans evolved to consume the kinds of food present before the invention of agriculture and therefore that the optimal diet seeks to emulate that kind of intake. No grains, no legumes, lots of dead animals. So in the absence of decisive evidence, how do you choose to, who to believe? How do you get people to take up your diet? I've identified four key ways. The first is you appeal to scientific evidence. Convince people the most trusted institution of knowledge is on your side. Flaunt your PhD, cite your sources. Nobody will read more than the first PubMed abstract. Second, position yourself as an underdog, telling secrets which contradict the conventional wisdom. And instead, side with common sense, what feels correct. Evolutionary explanations feel intuitively true. Millions of years of adaptation and natural selection mean that this, this is what you're meant to eat. Third, they instrumentalize human bodies with images of their own glistening six-packs or the dramatic weight loss that they've facilitated. They inculcate the idea that this, this just works, regardless of who's right on a theoretical level. Finally, they use numbers, calories, reps, kilograms, steps, grams of carbs and protein, all create the idea of objectivity and steady progress, which convinces people that their improvement is definite but incremental. Why does this matter, though? We live in a world in which information is ever more plentiful, but ever more contradictory. And the internet, far from making this easier, has only made it harder to disentangle truth from fiction. A single Google search reveals millions of sites, all claiming to be reputable, but all of which contradict each other. By understanding the kinds of arguments that we make and why we find them persuasive, we put ourselves in a position to understand what, uh, the most important decisions in our lives in a way that is as untainted as possible by sophistry. So, for people who choose to go against the grain, it's important to know why they're doing it. As for bread, the jury's still out. Tim, thank you very much. So, another moment to pause while the judges consider their verdicts. 
And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's underneath the iceberg. You've all heard our speakers, you're hearing, you've got a few more to have to go. But what I hope the presentations have done is given you a sense of wanting to know more. Uh, and that's what I'd like to explore now. That if I were to meet you and talk to you about what you do, could I find out more? Um, I didn't do this deliberately, but it does sort of link to Tim's talk in one way, because what I want to talk about is whether uh, the, the reliance that we now have on online information, are you using that to maximum effect? If I talk to you, can I then, as I walk away, find out more about you? Are you on your research group's website? Um, do you have a feed on one of the big social media platforms that enables me to see the sorts of opinions you have, the sort of contributions that you make? Can I get a sense of who you're networked to, which gives me a sense of your place within your community and within your discipline? So what I want to do in this moment is to give you a moment to pause and think about if you were to stand at the front like these guys have and to present the beginnings, you know, the first snapshot of research and to give an overview of what you do, could I find out more? Could I dig in? And are you visible online in a way that in the current environment you need to be? I suspect Sean's with me on this as that digital education. So we're going to continue. So Benita, can I invite you to come to the front? So our penultimate finalist now is Vanita, who is from our School of Health and Social Sciences. And her talk um, is based on her research about uncertainty in later life. She explores the, uh, the aging process, focusing on middle-aged individuals with chronic illness and, and in healthy states. It's distinctive to Malaysian adults, and it's looking at issues and priorities that can affect them on a day-to-day -day basis and how they sense these and handle them. Benita is in her third year of her PhD. She's from, uh, she's from Malaysia, and she studied health and social science at the National University there. She's also presented at the Universitas 21 Graduate Research Conference, which was held in the University of Auckland in 2014. Away from her research, she loves music and cooking. Benita, when you're ready. It was a terrible shock when my father died at the age of 59. While I know he died of a heart attack. I believe the main cause for his death was the prolonged anxiety he developed from his past actions and the uncertain future after his retirement. While it took more than 100 years for France, 85 years for Spain, and 45 years for Great Britain to double their population aged 65 years and above, from 7% to 14%, Malaysia will double her aged population in the next 25 years. Isn't it alarming that Malaysia has to act quickly by implementing a framework that assists Malaysians to age successfully? To date, however, there has been limited research on the problems of aging in multi-ethnic Malaysia. Therefore, in my PhD research, I'm trying to understand how middle-aged Malaysians make sense of their well-being in later life. I begin by asking the research participant, what does successful aging mean to you? Although the research participant can describe that successful aging required physical mobility, emotional well-being, financial freedom, spiritual fulfillment, and environmental supports, I realize that they have appeared to be daunted by uncertainty of how to achieve these objectives. Some of the questions raised were, how long I will live? What my life will be like when I die? Will my children pray for my soul? Uncertainty impregnated the narratives, appeared to cause them mental pressures, and may, may stop the participant to plan for their future. So where did I go with these findings? I investigated further to understand how middle-aged medals cope with the ambiguity they sensed. As you may see, the research participants, the research participant reconstructing the self through increasing fighting spirit, building external support, creating tolerance in all areas of, areas of life, and lowering the risk for a deteriorating body. Ladies and gentlemen, my PhD findings may not stop us from growing old. It might not help us to manage our midlife crisis. However, it can help us to understand better how we can deal the unpredictability of the future and provide clues to age successfully. Thank you.
Anita. Thank you very much. So we're almost at the end. We have one more finalist to go. But before we move on, I just want to, to sum up for all of them. We've got a, a really remarkable group of researchers here in front of you today. They are remarkable, but they're not unique. They've done something in taking part in Three Minutes Thesis, which will really help them stand out from the crowd. And so my final little input to you is to you, for you to start thinking how you are going to stand out from the crowd. Imagine being up against one of these at an interview now. So how are you going to demonstrate it? There are many, many opportunities during a PhD to do lots of different things. I've talked about public engagement. We have the Doors Open Day here at Edinburgh um, and all sorts of opportunities like that. But there's also the, the opportunities within your schools and within the university to be active in committees and societies, to shape the university into the sort of place where you want to study and want to be involved. So this is a, a call to all of you to think, how do I stand out like these guys stand out how do I demonstrate the success that I know is within me and the leadership that I want to show in the rest of my career? And whatever career path you follow, what are you doing now to boost your employability and position yourself? So I'm going to introduce our final finalist, Lulu. And really, my introduction to Lulu picks up on some of those points. Lulu comes from the School of Chemistry, our second finalist from there. Um, and she's a second-year PhD student looking at mass spectrometry imaging of spheroids, looking to observe the distribution of important molecules in cell culture. <coughs> Originally from London, she studied biochemistry as an undergraduate at Sheffield. But in her spare time, she's a cyclist. She's the women's coordinator for the Ron Cycling Club and runs an annual event called Ride Quality to improve accessibility for women in cycling. She also plays football for the university. Lulu, when you're ready. On average, it takes 10 years and over a billion pounds to get a drug from someone's idea. Oh, okay, sorry. On average, it takes 10 years and over a billion pounds to get a drug from someone's idea to saving lives. And of the 10,000 potential candidates, only one of these will go on to make it to market as a drug. This is because, as part of its development, the drug goes through a rigorous testing process, first in a simple two-dimensional cell culture to observe the effect on its target, and subsequently in a full biological system to check for any side effects in animals. Now, in 2010, the European Union introduced the three R's legislation to reduce, refine, and replace the use of animal models in scientific research. Now, given that 36% of drugs fail at this stage, it makes sense that we find a way to successfully bridge the gap between the oversimplicity of cell culture and the moral and ethical complications of animal testing. And that is where my research comes in. I work with a three-dimensional cell culture, known as spheroids, that mimic the environment of a tumor. Now, as a cancer grows, the cells nearest the blood vessel have a plentiful supply of oxygen and nutrients, and so can rapidly divide, whilst those at the center are not only starved of oxygen, but also have no way to get rid of their waste products. As these accumulate and reach a toxic level, the cells at the center die. And it's through the formation of these gradients of oxygen and nutrients that steroids form a three-layered structure, at the center, you have these dead cells, surrounded by a layer of silent cells. Now, whilst these are not actively dividing, they are still considered alive. And at the edge, you have the rapidly dividing cells that we most commonly associate with the word cancer. So using a number of imaging techniques, I am able to not only map the distribution of the drug, but also the product that it is broken down into. Furthermore, I can see how the drug and its products affect the important gradients that make up a cancer's biology. And finally, I can make spheroids that mimic other organs of the body, such as the liver, to check for any side effects. So taken together, spheroids offer an exciting opportunity to reduce the financial cost of drug discovery, to refine the drug earlier in its development, and to replace the premature use of animal models, both fulfilling the three hours legislation and potentially revolutionizing drug discovery. Thank you. Thank you, Lulu. Well done. 
and well done to all of you. Could I impose on my audience for a moment? Could we just thank all of our finalists again one more time? So that's been an amazing 30 minutes, a whistle-stop tour around all the wonders that we have here at the university. And a quick moment to thank as well the schools that have put forward finalists for all of our heats. Um, thank them for creating cultures in which they celebrate the ability to communicate. So, so well done to all of them as well. What I want to do now is just before we break is to remind you of your role now. The judging begins. So our judges will retire shortly to consider um, their decision, and you will too. You have in front of you a voting form, and what I would like you to, to do is to consider which of those talks was the most engaging, which, which of our finalists communicated to you most effectively, um, who excited you, generally who impressed you the most. I shall, as, I, as we do every year, I shall, again, encourage you, leave your discipline biases behind and vote for that person who had the most impact on you. Everyone who's in here gets one vote, and you should only check one box. Once you've done that, can you please hand in your form to one of the organisers who are going to be at the door as we go out for our break? So, thank you for all coming back so promptly. Far more promptly than the judges, who have had a very, very difficult decision to make. Um, and I have to say, as they will explain, it was, this was not unanimous. There was a lot of debate and discussion upstairs. And I think that really is to the kudos of all our finalists, um, that everybody had their favourites, everybody was engaged by different things. You're all to be congratulated. So before we do that, in the spirit of everyone's a winner, can we have a final round of applause for our finalists? <laughs> But of course, not everyone's a winner. Someone is a winner. So I'm going to hand over to Fiona, who is going to announce, first of all, who was second place? Who was the runner-up from the judges panel deliberations? Oops. Thank you. Yes, to just reiterate, we did have a difficult job to do. And because the, the, the presentations were all of such a high standard, and we were extremely impressed. Um, and but. One of the things that we obviously had to make a decision, which was difficult, but we did. Um, and um, we really looked at, well, what was the significance of the research that the presenter was doing? Did we understand the significance of not the broad research so much, but what they're doing? And that was one of the things that we used for, for um, our decisions. But they were difficult, so I won't uh, keep you any longer. Um, the, so the second prize winner was Izzy. Well done, Izzy. She has the mystery box of self-improvement. You can do with that as you wish. Um, so that will only encourage you to do a bit of networking afterwards and find out. Um, Fiona, who was the People's Choice? Our People's Choice winner was Ewan. You'll have to get up again, Ewan. <laughs> You're the winner. <laughs> so, Ewan, congratulations. Congratulations to the School of Chemistry, who are well represented here today, and I'm sure we'll be celebrating with some style later. Um, all our best wishes and good luck go for you to the final. Please do us proud. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we will be watching, um, so go well. And enjoy Birmingham, which is, as we said, God's own city. So, some, some final comments, as we said. The, the thing today was th about this importance of being able to convey the importance of research, and you all did that beautifully. We have a, a wide variety of research done here at Edinburgh, and we're very proud of that diversity, and you all presented that in a really effective and compelling way. Um, 
there's so much to thank the university for in terms of the support you've got from your schools, but I'm going to say a few very specific thank yous now. The first is a thank you to our judges. So judges, come from behind your table and come to the front of the room. We have a small gift to give you. And as I said, researchers are all heroes, so these are our own little judges of heroes, so thank you all very much for that. Fiona Hill. Excellent, thank you. So the, the judges, yeah. Uh, <laughs> this isn't your moment anymore. So, uh, so the judges um, had a really difficult job, and I must, having gone up there about 10 minutes ago, and they sort of looked at me and went, It isn't time yet, is it? They really struggled. Everybody had different favourites, everybody had been impressed by different things, and I think, again, that is credit to all of you. Um, there is one more person to thank. Um, I have the job of standing here today and presenting Three Minute Thesis. I do very, very little um, in the preparation. But there is one person who is really the go-to person for Three Minute Thesis. She push, supports and encourages our finalists. She engages the schools. She supports everyone in the university through training. Um, and Louise, who is shaking her head. Um, Louise, could you come to the front? Because... <laughs> It really wouldn't have happened. Really wouldn't have happened this afternoon without Louise. And she does a sterling work, sterling work all year round in IAD to support our researchers. So thank you. So what I will do now is close down the three-minute thesis competition for this year. I hope that somebody in this audience, several people in this audience, are inspired to perhaps have a go next year. I hope that some of you watching at home might have a go next year, whether that's at the University of Edinburgh or whether that's at your own institutions. This only happens because researchers are willing to engage in the process and talk about the research that they all find so fascinating. If any of you would like to take photographs of the finalists, now is your opportunity. Um, and thank you all for the support you've shown to all of the people who presented today. The, the People's Choice Votes was also a very good spread. You've all got a lot to be proud of. Thank you all, and I'll see you next year.